Ezra chapter 4, 1 to 24, the devil's schemes. Let me remind you that while Ezra's writing this book, he doesn't appear in it till later on. This book covers a whole, a, a whole range of, a whole span of uh, 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 over 80 years or more. And in the first few chapters, we read about the people who first came back from Babylon to Judah and Jerusalem. And if you've been here, you'll remember uh, that in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, we just, we just looked at those beginnings under the title Word and Spirit, and we noticed when these things took place in the first year of Cyrus. God didn't have to sort of wind Cyrus up to get him to put his word into practice. We noticed why it happened. It was because God's word was to be fulfilled, that all these things were happening that we're reading here, that it says that the word of the Lord might be fulfilled, the word of the Lord by Jeremiah, the prophet that no one took any notice of all through his long ministry. And we noticed what happened. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. It was God who was at work. Yeah. We noticed those who's that were involved. Jeremiah, the nobody, the prophet no one listened to. Cyrus, the great emperor, who thought he had the whole world in his hands. And actually, the Lord, he was at work, stirring the hearts. And then in cha chapter 1, verse 5, through to the end of chapter 2, Chapter 2 with all 70 verses, we went through all those names and we noticed the exiles return. All these people, over 42,000 people, on the move from Babylon back to Jerusalem. And we noticed it under those uh, four points, intricacy or detail. The God's interest, interested even in the detail. You read that list and you think, oh, all those names, all those people, all those places. Why is that in Scripture? It's so boring. But it reminds us that God knows everyone and every place. He knows you, where you are now, where you've been, before, where you've lived before, your relatives, your friends, your colleagues, everybody the Lord knows. Nothing misses his notice. We notice that all these people on the move, they were moving under inspiration. It said the Lord stirred their spirits, all of them, to go. The spirits of all, the hearts of all were in the hand of the Lord. We notice that they overcame inconvenience. It's not, not exactly fun walking from Babylon to Jerusalem. Most of them walked. There were a few donkeys, we noticed, a few cows and other things. They overcame inconvenience. They overcame, what was that other one beginning with I? Indigence. Indigence. You got it. Indigence. Poverty. Most of them, we noticed, they weren't well-to-do people. They couldn't afford a camel. To ride along or a, or a horse or even a donkey many of them these were the people who went to build and we noticed some overcame insult they couldn't prove that they were from the priestly family and they were told no you can't partake in eating the sacrifices or serving the lord you just have to get your hands dirty doing other stuff like everybody else but they didn't create trouble and then last week we got to chapter three and we noticed the new beginnings you remember what they started with? What did they start to do in the building project? Did they start start with the roof? Oh, Even before that? Even before they did the foundations? What did they start with? The altar. The altar. Thank you. They started with the altar. And we noticed, therefore, these, these, these things, they did this as one man. There was fervor, F, these Fs, different Fs. There was focus. They started with sacrifice. And we noticed how we, even way back before the nation of Israel was formed, how sacrifice always came first. Do you remember? God sacrificed even in Eden. Animals to clothe Adam and Eve. Abel sacrificed. Abraham, the first thing he did when he got into the promised land, he sacrificed. That's, what, that's how true worship is focused. And it is even today, now, if, if, your, if your heart isn't focused around the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it, it, you're going to go badly wrong. Because you can, only, you can only come into the presence of God and worship God and serve God through sacrifice. And we notice it produced a sacrifice in return that they made offerings. They offered their tithes and their offerings, their free will offerings, to enable the work of the Lord to go forward. And then we notice fundamentals. 
they started with the foundations. And in the New Testament context, we said, we've got to start with the, the fundamentals, the apostles' doctrine, that's the preaching of the word, and prayer. And they must have been excited. Don't you think they were excited when they got the foundations going? I would have been excited if I'd been there and I would have been thinking back. I know some of them were howling their eyes out because they could remember how good the, the Solomon's temple was and they, did, and they thought this isn't going to be much. But most of the, most of the ones who weren't miseries, they were, they were full of excitement. And they just start building and then, and then what happens? They start encountering the devil's schemes. It doesn't mention the name of the devil here, but we know, we know that as John says in his letter, the whole world lies in the wicked one. And we see them at work here, the devil's schemes. So I've got some more alliteration for you. You might have guessed it. I've got ingratiating, intimidating, and insinuating. Or if you want it, perhaps more simple to remember, mealy-mouthed, menacing, and mis misrepresenting. Mealy-mouthed is when people aren't sincere. They're sort of flattering. This whole chapter, then, is about opposition to the work of rebuilding the temple, about opposition to reestablishing the worship of God and reestablishing the, pe the people of Judah as a worshiping people. And they're building, these, they're building this, um, this uh, temple. They've put the foundations in. They're already offering sacrifices, and their neighbors soon get to hear what's going on in Jerusalem. Someone must have been tittled at him, wasn't it? Perhaps it was his enthusiasm and they couldn't contain it. Or perhaps there were some, there, there were some traitors amongst the, their number. But whatever happens, the news gets up north. Now oh, there's new beginnings down in Jerusalem. They've got that altar set up now. They're, they're, they're offering sacrifices. And free will offerings are being offered. You can see, you see all these offerings that the people are being, bringing to help the work of God go forward. We can't stop them. The temple of God is being rebuilt. The foundations. And this causes a stir. This causes a reaction. It starts with apparent cooperation, as we've seen. Then it turns into intimidation. And then finally, malicious misrepresentation and physical force. And just the whole chapter reminds us of the certainty of satanic opposition whenever the work of God goes forward. And of course, he uses people. He uses other people. But if, the, if God is ever doing a work, a good work, you will find that Satan is busy in one way or another working against it. You can be absolutely assured that if you personally start to make spiritual progress, or if your church starts to go forward in obedience and service to the Lord, if progress is being made, the devil, sooner rather than later, will throw all his energies into hindering you and your fellow believers. He will throw all his energies into demoralizing us. And if you haven't found that out yet, it could be either that you haven't been a Christian very long and you're still in your honeymoon period, or it could be that you aren't a Christian yet, or it might be you've fallen asleep at the wheel and you don't see the crash, the car crash that's coming along the road. But if Christ is in you, and if you're zealously following him, be sure that Satan will be enraged. As certainly as Christ is here with us, and he exists, Satan is busy at work trying to oppose you as a Christian and the people of God corporately. He and his subjects are always busy at work in one way or another. And in Ezra chapter 4, the opposition doesn't come from their age-old enemies, those nations around the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Philistines. We all know about the Philistines, don't we? I think you'd think there were still some around today, the way people use that term. Uh, but it, it doesn't come from any of those. It comes from the northern territory 
of Israel, known as Samaria now. Not from aliens over the border, but from what they're called the people of the land, their neighbors, certainly made up of the different nations we read about, where most of them came from. They probably intermarried with the remnants of Israelites that were there and built up some tradition of, uh, of, uh, of religion which involved things from the Old Testament. Do you remember the story of the woman at the well of Samaria that Jesus spoke to? You remember that story? And she said, our father, our father Jacob gave us this well and told us to worship at this mountain. Right? So, you know, you, that, that's, this, that's, that's where this all had its beginnings, back there. The Assyrian king, sometimes known as Shalmaneser, he exiled many northern Israelites, scattered them across his empire to destroy their identity as a people, and he brought in these other nations. They were polytheists, many gods. That's what it means, they worship many gods. They continued to worship the gods of their original nations, and then because of these lions that we read about coming in amongst them, terrorizing them, they then started to learn how to worship, they thought, Jehovah, the God of Israel. But however much they may appear to worship God, do you notice how Ezra describes them? In the fourth word of that first verse of chapter four, what does he call them? Adversaries, enemies. And we see it now working out. So the first thing is this mealy-mouthed or ingratiating. You see that? In verse 2, they approached the rubble and the heads of the fathers' houses and said, said, let us build with you. For we worship your God as you do. They sound so plausible, don't they? They sound reasonable. They sound genuine. They sound gracious. Oh, so compatible with the Jews themselves, with their own aim to reestablish the worship of God. We worship your God as you do. I mean, if you hear those words, normally that would make you excited, wouldn't it? Warm your heart. When you detect that someone else is a, is a, is a believer, when you meet someone else in the, in the army or at work, or amongst your neighbors, or even when you're traveling or on holiday, you meet someone else who says, I, I worship God. It warms your heart normally, doesn't it? And that's what, that's what they said. Well, we, we worship God like you do. They seem to have the right focus. We said sacrifice was the focus. They said, we have been sacrificing to him. And they appear consistent because they've been doing it ever since the days of Asa Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. That was a long time. That was over 200 years. What more could Zerubbabel and the Jews want by way of helpers? These friendly people, keen to help, who worship the same God with sacrifice for hundreds of years. And yet, what does Zerubbabel say? He says, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone were built to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. You know, I think if I'd been there, and I'd been listening to this, I might have been inclined to say, it's a rubble. That's, that's a bit heavy. That answer's a bit heavy. That's a bit terse. That's a bit unkind. Don't you think that's bound to get their backs up? I can imagine myself saying that to him afterwards. Well, well couldn't you have been a bit more polite? Can you be a bit more friendly, a bit more appreciative? How could they possibly do any harm? If we had their physical help, their backs into the work, if we had their, their financial help, if we had their moral support, the work of building the temple would go on and go up. And well, even if they're a bit out of line, if, even if they're a bit unorthodox, they don't quite believe all the same things about Jehovah as we do. If you're polite and friendly, you'll be able to gently nudge them in the right direction. Do you know that's fatally flawed thinking? 
I can imagine people thinking that as that was going on. It would have, it could have been embarrassing for some people. You, you and I might have been embarrassing if we, if we'd been there listening to that. Embarrassed if we'd heard that conversation. But to think that you can help people in that way, letting them cooperate with you in the service of God when they don't know God, that's fatally flawed thinking. We saw what happened in 2 Kings 17. They tried to worship their gods that they brought with them and the God of Israel. And what did it say? They went on doing this all the time, but they were never truly worshippers of God. They didn't really serve God. And it was that sort of behavior that led to the captivity and destruction of Jerusalem in the first place. And do you remember King Solomon? What was Solomon's great flaw? What did he do? Yeah, how many wives did he have? Do you know? 600, 400 concubines. And he let them all worship. Yeah, that's right, Megan. And he let them all worship their own gods. And what happened? Did he win the round? Did he win the round to become true believers in Jehovah? No, they led him astray. And because of that, God said, I'm taking the kingdom away from your son. Zerubbabel and his team knew only too well what would happen if they'd let these people join in. One thing would lead to another, and it would, they would rapidly end up in the same situation as their forefathers. Now, you might read this and think, well, that's not very Christian, the way Zerubbabel spoke. That's not very kind. But let me, <laughs> let me remind you of three incidents in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and he didn't eat or drink? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? And he was, he was tired. You'd be hungry and faint after 40 days. And Satan came to him and said, oh, I'm worried about you. You're looking hungry. You're worn out. You need something to eat. Why didn't you command those stones to be made bread? And did Jesus say, oh, thank you for that idea. It is written, man shall live, not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He sent Satan packing. And here's one which is perhaps even, even uh, more sort of charged against your nerves. But one day a man called Simon invited Jesus to his house for a meal, along with a bunch of other people. Right? So they went for a feast. And as was customary with that Roman influence, they would have all been uh, with their heads around the table and their feet poking outwards, lying, reclining at supper right? or at dinner. And so there's Jesus. He's, he's, he's like reclining at supper like the others, tucking into this, this nice lamb or roast beef or whatever it was that was served up. And this woman comes in from the neighborhood. And she starts crying all over his feet. And then she dries his feet with her hair. You know the story, don't you? And then she pours perfume on his feet. And the, 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 the host, Simon, he says, if this man, that's how he thought of Jesus, if this man were a prophet, he would know that this woman is a sinner, a disreputable woman from the neighborhood, an immoral woman. He would know that. And of course, he did know that because he turned. Jesus turned to Simon. He said, Simon, I've got something to say to you. A certain man had two men owed him money. One owed him a million pounds and the other a hundred pounds. And when they neither of them could pay their debts, he freely forgave them both. Which do you think would love him more? And Simon said, well, I suppose the man who owed more. And Jesus said, you've, you've, uh, you've judged rightly. He said, I came into your house. You gave me no water for my feet. You gave me no kiss of welcome, as was customary. You did not anoint my head with oil. Look what she's done. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. And by implication, he's saying to Simon, but not yours. Now, can you imagine doing that in polite company? You're, you're sat there tucking into this guy's 
You have a wonderful meal, his choicest lamb or beef or whatever it is. And then you turn around and say to him, your sins are forgiven. Effectively, that's what Jesus was saying. You, Simon, you have behaved very rudely. Yes, this is a nice lamb, but you have behaved rudely and simply, and your sins are not forgiven. Jesus didn't say, oh, yeah, we could do a thing together, do a thing, good a thing or two together here, Simon. He distanced himself from Simon's character and conduct. And you remember, I mentioned the story of the woman at the well. And Jesus was very, very courteous and friendly to this woman. But when she started asking questions about religion, and she said, well, you know, where should we worship? Should we worship at Jerusalem? Or like Jacob said, at, at, this, at this mountain, we've got this well here that he gave us as well. And Jesus' reply was in, in many ways quite, uh, uh, um, what's the word, terse. He says, you Samaritans worship you know not what. You don't know what you're doing. That sounds quite terse, doesn't it? Salvation, he says, is from the Jews, comes through the Jews. <coughs> he maintains that distinction. Even though he was really friendly and polite and she was saved through the conversation. But he didn't say, oh, well, well yeah, we could be quite friendly about this together. No, you, you, you come up to Jerusalem and then I'll come on to your mountain and we'll worship together. He didn't do any of that stuff. And here's the application for us from this point of, of their reaction. True Christians must always be gracious to everybody made in God's image. And not just other Christians who think the same. But you can never cooperate in the work of God with false believers. With those who make out that they believe the same things as you, but don't. And you know, these days, there are many churches and many church leaders who would like to think that they're on the same path as us and they want us to join in the ecumenical movement or churches together or something like that. They think we're building the same church. They think we're fighting the same war. They think we're serving the same Lord, but it is not the case. There are many in so-called churches who do not believe what we believe here, that the Bible is the inspired word of God. They do not believe that Jesus is truly the son of God. They do not believe in the reality and eternity of heaven and hell. They do not believe that it was necessary for Jesus to die for their sins, what we call the atonement. They do not believe in male and female as God made them in Genesis chapter 1. They do not believe in church leadership as it's ordained. Male leadership of, of uh, pastors and teachers and elders. And you cannot walk with them or you'll end up where they're going. And where they're going is not very pleasant. You cannot walk with them or you will compromise the gospel. You'll have, if you start walk, walking along with people like that, trying to work with them like that, say, oh, well, we can get on with your church so far. What will happen? You will be the one who starts trimming your message. You'll start saying, well, I better not say that because they'll find that offensive. And I better not say that. And I better not do that. And in the end, you won't be able to preach any gospel at all. And this has been going on for a long time. Over 120 years ago, a man called C.H. Spurgeon wrote these words. Believers in Christ's atonement are now in open union with those who make light of it. Believers in Holy Scripture are working with those who deny inspiration. Those who believe evangelical doctrine are in open alliance with those who call the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned and we became sinners, a fable. They call the fall a fable. And he says, those who say they're evangelicals are joining with them. Those who deny the person of the Holy Spirit and who call, uh, uh, they, they join with those as well, and they join with those who call justification by faith immoral. They, they, these who are evangelicals, they even join with those who believe that there's a second chance after death. And this is what Spurgeon says. It is our solemn conviction that there should be no pretense of fellowship with such people. Fellowship with known and vital error is participation in sin. And their teaching 
if these people can do no good towards God and man, or man. Those people who don't believe the doctrine that we believe from the word of God as a church, they do, can do no good for God or man, is what he says. If their message were preached for a thousand years by their most earnest preachers, it would never renew a single soul or overcome pride in a single human heart. Now you might say, well, what's that got to do with me? I go out to work every day on, on the base or, it, you know, wherever I'm working. Or I'm, I'm just, I'm busy at home doing whatever I'm doing. You say, what has all this got to do with me that you're talking about? I say a lot. It is our responsibility as individuals to encourage the preaching of the true gospel, to encourage the pastors and teachers, so to encourage Barnaby in going on preaching the truth in this congregation and to take a strong stance in defending the truth. And it's your responsibility, our responsibility, to hold church leaders to account if they start to deviate from the word of God. That is your solemn responsibility. Any faithful Jew within earshot of Zerubbabel would have said, if you waver Zerubbabel, you'll get no help from me in what you're doing. And any faithful Christian will say to his pastor, to her pastor, if you ever start toadying up to those churches that don't preach the gospel and to those leaders who deny the truth, expect to see no more of me. One day, a very good king called Jehoshaphat went to fight alongside King Ahab. King Ahab was mostly an idolater, but occasionally he'd play lip service to God. And when King Jehoshaphat came back, God sent a prophet called Jehu out to meet him. And he said to him, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. We dare not join hands with those who don't <clears throat> truly believe and love the Lord and his truth. If we do that, we won't say them and we will lose ourselves. So that's a very strong point, and that's the longest point, because in a way, that's the most subtle point. But then we see, we see further on, in verse 4, the menacing or the intimidating behavior. The people of the land, so this is the second point, the people of the land then discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus king of Persia until the days of Darius. So Zerubbabel, seeing through their behavior and repudiating their friendly offer, the, the Jude enemies show their true colors by resorting to uglier methods. And they discourage. Literally, that means they weaken their hands. I'm sure you know what it's like to have someone around who manages to dishearten you, whatever you do and whatever they say. That they dampen your spirit so that you cannot summon up enthusiasm and necessary strength. Whatever you suggest, they see a problem looming. Whatever you do, they find fault with it. I, I expect that's what has happened. And it says they made them afraid to build. And that word afraid, it's the idea of palpitations. Have you ever been so afraid that you have palpitations? Anybody know that? You know that? We call it panic attacks these days. But that, that's, that's what they induced in them, the rumors. You can read about some of the rumors in the next book, Nehemiah. And Wilson says this word means great disturbance of mind through the news of some unexpected uh, calamity. So it's meant rumors were being spread. And then they bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. Skilled writers, maybe, or speakers, consultants. You can imagine planning officers were being bribed so as to, to make the work of the temple rebuilding difficult or something like that. And this strategy was maintained, this menacing of the people of God, this intimidation of the people of God was sustained for 17 or 18 years. And it was clearly successful in hindering the work. Barnaby reminded us of that when he started preaching through Haggai. The work was held up for 18 years. And this happens again now to the people of God. It happened down through the ages. 
when, when those who don't believe the true gospel, when they're unable to get us to compromise, they instead intimidate and try to frighten and undermine and, and it mock and do everything to discourage true Christians. And let me remind you again of what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout his ministry, the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests and the Sadducees, they were always there. Have you noticed that in the Gospels? They were always there. And what were they doing? Did they ever encourage him? They were always hounding him. They were trying to intimidate him. Do you remember that time he, they went into the synagogue and there was this man there uh, with a withered hand and they were all there looking, glowering, daring him, daring Jesus to heal the man. Now, of course, Jesus faced them out, but that's what he, that's what he endured throughout his three-year ministry. And that's what they continued to do after Jesus had gone and the, and the apostles were leading the work. And Jesus predicted that we will experience the same when we maintain our stand on God's word. And when we keep our distance from false churches and false Christians who deny the truth, they will criticize and they will undermine. And we can expect to feel discouraged and we can expect to feel inclined to give up. Do you ever feel inclined to give up? That it's not worth the fight of trying to uphold the truth. You know, if you're faithful to the Lord, you cannot expect to go on along in your comfortable little life of church and home and work and all of that sort of thing without meeting discouragement. And sometimes we'll feel the tide of opinion against the truth to be overwhelming. We might be tempted to go on permanent leave. But we must persevere and not lose heart. Let me just say one word of application. Your perseverance in, in, in appreciating the truth in just this congregation, your perseverance through discouragement is a powerful encouragement to everyone else here. When you persevere, each one of us, when you as an individual persevere in following the Lord Jesus Christ, so I can look at each one of you and say, when you're doing that, you are a powerful encouragement to every other Christian. And especially to those responsible for feeding the word. I'm sure you know that's the case. It's a powerful encouragement when people keep going through the face of discouragement and supporting the work. Oh, then finally, we've got this misrepresentation or this insinuating. I won't read that passage, verses 7 to 24, the letter that they write. It's a very cunning letter. They're not satisfied, these enemies of the, of the Jews, with just discouraging and hindering the work. They resort to a more devastating method. We know that Zerubbabel arrived in Jerusalem at the command of Cyrus and with express authority to build God's temple there in Jerusalem. But now Cyrus is gone. He's been dead some time. He's no more. His successor, Cambyses, is also dead. And a long enough interval has passed now for memories of Cyrus's edict to have faded. <coughs> faded from public now. And so these enemies now write this cunning letter. They knew full well that Zerubbabel himself was only doing what he was commanded. They knew that. They knew full well that he had not attempted any rebellion or withholding any tax revenues. But they cunningly misrepresent him. And do you remember? They urged the emperor, Artaxerxes, to check the historical records. You'll most certainly find evidence that Jerusalem is a rebellious city. And you can go back to the days of the kings in Judah, King Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, Zedekiah, and you'll see that there was a rebellion against Babylon all the time. Scripture records their rebellion as the reason for the captivity, Babylonian captivity. But these, these enemies of the Jews, they now make out that Zerubbabel himself and his helpers, they're building the temple for the very self-same reason, to make it a focus for resistance against the emperor. They deliberately, of course, ignore the fact that they were loyal subjects like Daniel, who was a right-hand man to King Darius. 
They deliberately failed to mention and remind. They can remind him about Jerusalem, but they, de they deliberately failed to remind him of Cyrus's commission. They won't mention what a good governor Zerubbabel is. They throw mud, and as you know, and when mud is thrown, it sticks. They lead the king's mind down the road to the inevitable conclusion, but wrong conclusion, that Zedekiah, Zerubbabel, is planning rebellion. And I, I, as I read this chapter, I envisage, I envisage this letter coming back from the king. And I, and I envisage these guys hearing this letter being read. And, oh, their delight. With malicious glee and at breakneck speed, they go hurtling over to Jerusalem. And by force of arms, they bring the work of building the temple to a sudden and total end. Can't you hear them crowing? <coughs> I can hear them crowing, laughing, mocking, sneering. Can't you see those people who were there trying to do the work, dispirited now with their heads hung down and their hearts heavy, a deep sense of shame and sorrow and frustration. Can't you imagine them thinking, oh, why, God, why, why? Why did you let it happen? But that's how the chapter ends. It ends with the work being stopped. Then we have to face the facts. Sometimes the church of Christ faces seemingly total failure. Setback, long delays. But when that happens, we must remember that God is still in control. It's not the end. And let me take you again to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He faced the same. After those three years of menace and intimidation from the, from the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests, they arrest him. Like these people here in Ezra 4, those, those priests and others, they made false accusations against Jesus. And they stuck. They, they intimidated and lured Pilate into crucifying Jesus. And if you know the Gospels, you will know that they, they stood around the cross and they crowed when Jesus was dying. Do you remember how they said, ha, he who saved others, let him save himself. And then they said to Jesus, and if you are the Christ, come down from the cross. They were crowing. And then Jesus died. Everything seemed to have come to a juddering and tragic end. But it wasn't the end. And it wasn't the end for these Jews either. Let me remind you of the Apostle Paul. Wherever he went preaching the gospel, what happened? The Jews were there, weren't they, waiting. They followed him. They got there before him. They did all they could to upset his work and hinder him. And finally they got him. Finally they got him when he got to Jerusalem. They had a riot. They managed to get him arrested. And he was in prison in Caesarea for two years. Ah, his work has stopped. The mission work of the church has stopped. But no. God wants Paul to testify to Caesar himself. And so off, off to Rome, Paul goes as a prisoner in that boat that got wrecked. And he pre was preaching right under Caesar's nose. And he preached right under Caesar's nose with such effect that he can say these words in Philippians chapter 1. I want you to know, brothers, that what happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. The whole imperial guard. And to all the rest. That my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You could think, 
What a waste. All that effort, all that effort of Paul's preaching all across the Roman world. And now he's locked up in prison. What a waste, Lord. He could have had two or more years trampling all across uh, Asia Minor or get, get over even to Spain. Lord, what a waste of time. No, no, no. The Lord wanted Paul prepared and sent right into the heart of government. And there he was, preaching to the whole imperial guard and all the rest and encouraging other people to do so. And when you look back here at Ezra chapter 4, you think, oh, what a miserable end. The work has come to an end. But you turn over to chapter 5 and you find, as Barnaby reminded us when he was preaching through Haggai, Haggai starts preaching and in two or three months, the temple is finished. Days of deep discouragement might be our present experience, or they might be waiting for us just around the corner. But don't despair. We should encourage each other. You should encourage especially those who feed you the word. Because God and his people will have the last laugh. Despite the mealy-mouthed behavior, despite the menacing, despite the, the lying, the misrepresentation, the church will triumph in the end. But let me ask you, make sure you're on the right side, a true believer and not a fake. Well, we're going to sing an ancient hymn. I always know I'm right with the time because it's always a quarter to, to a nine on this clock, so it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> And our hymn is to finish with is 788. This is what should be a well-known hymn. He who would uh, true, who would true valor see, or he who would valiant be. It's John Bunyan's hymn. It's sort of with the thoughts of pilgrim progress in mind. Um, you might wonder what in, in verse three hobgoblins are. In this case, we're talking about we're talk. I, I, I would have chosen the, the, the version that's in Grace hymns if it were my choice. But since we've got new Christian hymns, we've got hobgoblins in, in, in verse three, and we think of those as evil spirits. Hobgoblins and foul fiends, they're the evil spirits. So we're going to sing, "Who would true valor see?" And then after that, we'll pray.